Well, hi, everyone, and thank you for joining the Institute for Market Transformations Climate Career Lunch and Learn series. The purpose of the series is to make climate work more accessible to those seeking a career in this space by fostering connections and exchanging information. I'm Betsy Law, IMT's Managing Director of Operations and the moderator for today's discussion. So in today's chat, um, we'll hear from some of our IMT team members about why they do this work, and also we'll hold time to answer questions from you all. So um, we do want to foster connections. So take a moment to drop your name, pronouns, location, and your LinkedIn, if you'd like to, via the chat box so you can all, um, you know, connect with one another. And here at IMT, you know, we have a great team that represents a mix of experiences with and without backgrounds in climate. So um, I'm super excited to introduce introduce our IMT panelists for today. Ella Wetlesson, um, Senior Associate of Business Engagement. Rajiv Ravalapati, Senior Manager of Government Engagement. Caitlin M. Kaplinger, Senior Communications Associate of Storytelling, Juliana DiLauro, Senior Manager of Community Engagement, and Sarah Beth Kay, Development Manager. So um, before we pose a series of questions to our IMT team, let's ask ourselves, what is a climate job? Project Drawdown, um, an employee's guide to drawdown aligned business, describes a climate job as a job that allows you to apply your expertise and skills to address the climate crisis while holding your organization accountable to its climate action goals. So, which means every job is a climate job. So from finance to communications to fundraising, um, you know, we all have a role to play. So I am, um, again, super excited to turn to our IMT team for some perspective. Um, hi, team. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. Um, how is everyone doing? Thumbs up, thumbs sideways, thumbs down. How are we all, how are we all doing? Doing awesome. great. <laughs> great. So the first easy question I have for you all, um, how are you addressing the climate crisis in your current job? I'm going to just uh, call on folks as I see them on my screen. So Ella, let's start with you. Um, how are you addressing the climate crisis in your current job? Yeah, well, <clears throat> so I'm on the business team at IMT. And so I primarily work with real estate owners and companies that are looking to reduce their carbon and energy reduction in their portfolio. Um, so that's through work in our Green Lease Leaders program, as well as high performance building hubs. Um, yeah, and specifically owners that are able to reduce their carbon emissions that directly translates to lowering the amount of greenhouse gases going into the sky. So that is how I'm doing it. Awesome. Sarah Beth, how are you addressing climate crisis in your current job? Hi, everyone. So happy to see you all here. I work as the development manager at IMT, and I'm addressing the climate crisis by shifting funding from the government, philanthropic institutions, and corporate donors to those who are addressing the climate crisis, such as IMT, government, environmental justice organizations, technical assistance organizations, and frontline community-based organizations. Awesome. Juliana, tell us more about what you do. Hi, everybody. Juliana Di Lauro. Um, I'm the Senior Manager of Community Engagement at IMT. Um, and policymaking has been a very like top-down process for decades. And um, I get the really fun job of shifting the status quo and you know, reminding everybody that it's true that the people that are closest to the problem understand the solutions better than anybody. So I get to shift that perspective and push for um, policy, but not just policy, solutions, climate solutions that address the real problems and the real concerns of frontline communities. Great. Thank you, Juliana. Rajiv. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Rajiv Rabalapati. Um, like Betsy said, I'm IMT Senior Manager for Government Engagement here at IMT. And my role in addressing the climate crisis, so I'm talking to state and local governments every day on trying to figure out how can we provide them resources or our time or efforts on their policymaking journey. And to the point that Juliana said, how policymaking has tr traditionally been from a top down, um, a lot of my job is getting them to 
think differently about their policy making and look at the community that they serve um, because they are a they are a stakeholder. Um, their experiences, their lived experiences, stakeholders are very vital in developing policy. So I work with governments at a very high level on just problem solving, working on applications together to go for to go after federal funding opportunities and to really think about how community has a necessary and vital role in shifting the building decarbonization or climate goals that any jurisdiction may have. Great. Thanks, Rajiv. And Caitlin, how are you addressing that in storytelling? Yeah, so climate communications is so important. Um, a lot of the earlier messaging was tied to like animal and ecosystem loss, which galvanized some, but most people are so consumed and stressed by the daily pressures of life. It's really hard to think about the polar bears when your utility bills are piling up. So in my role, it's about making this really overwhelming global challenge, something that people can relate to and not feel paralyzed by. And also leveling with people and saying that this crisis didn't spring up overnight and that justice is non-negotiable. And finally about lifting up the brilliance of people and communities who are working every day to create a, a new way of life. Well, you all are doing some impressive work, um, but I'd love to start at the beginning. So I had found my first climate job through Craigslist about 10 plus years ago, and I know the world has changed. Um, how did you come across your first job in the climate space? And if you changed industries, what went into your decision? So I'll start here with Rajiv. Sure. So um, as back, a little background on me, I graduated from Loyola University in Chicago with a degree in environmental studies. I graduated in 2011. And for those of you who may rem remember that time of when you were fresh out of college, it was really hard to find a job. Um, I didn't jump right. I didn't, my first job was not necessarily in the climate space. It was kind of like, it was what Caitlin mentioned earlier. I worked for Lincoln Park Zoo in Chicago as an education assistant. And then I worked a bunch of random jobs until I found my first real job in the climate space. Um, so I say all that because it took me really a long time to break into the climate space. I literally was a person who sold vacuums door to door before getting my first job in the climate space. But when I did, um, it was my sister. Uh, she found a job for the Citizens Utility Board in Chicago. They're a local nonprofit that focuses on consumer advocacy on regulated utilities in the state of Illinois. Uh, she found that job on idealist.org, sent it to me and said, hey, I think this matches with your degree. I know you've never done anything in energy, but take a shot. And so I went for it and I got that job. And that was the beginning of, of where my career is taken to me now. Great, thanks Rajiv. Caitlin? Yeah, so prior to starting at IMT, I had been working in the arts all of my life in every possible facet of that. And it isn't always the case, but when your passion is your job, is your life, is your passion, et cetera, it's really easy for companies to take advantage of you. So come 2020, I was really burnt out and I was resentful towards the arts industry that is largely self-congratulatory and boring and elitist. And I knew I wanted to work on something systemic like the climate crisis, but I didn't think that I had the technical expertise to contribute anything. Sustainability had always been incredibly important to me as an individual, but I, you know, I wanted to be working on the systemic issues. So in January, 2022, I hit the mother of all breaking points. And I started working with a career coach who specialized in industry changes. Uh, her name is Adenola Adeshola. She's amazing. And she helped me see my skills in a new light. So once I got really specific as to what I wanted out of my next role, I literally Googled climate job storytelling communications equity and the job posting popped up. Um, and after my first phone interview with Betsy in March, I put in my notice uh, without anything confirmed, but I was like, I got this. And then thankfully the offer from IMT came. 
And we're so excited to have you here and have had you just, um, again, help support and make our storytelling better in, in this space. So yes, very excited that you're on board with us, Caitlin. Um, Sarah Beth, how about yourself? So IMT is my very first climate job, and I'm really excited to be here. Prior to working in the climate space, I worked in the Jewish nonprofit world for around five years. And before that, I had a variety of fun jobs. <laughs> uh, the reason why I decided to change into the climate space is because I felt like this is really the issue of our time. And I wanted to be doing something where I could put the majority of my working hours towards climate justice and uh, mitigating, you know, the worst effects of climate change. What, is, I mean, that's what mainly influenced my decision. And the other thing that influenced my decision was I wanted to work in a field where we were all working together towards a larger goal. And it feels like the climate space is that goal. I came across this job in a job board. Not particularly exciting, but very useful. Great. Thanks, Sarah Beth. Juliana? Yeah, so... I got into the climate space by accident. Um, I started off my career doing policy for the Department of Labor and other different agencies, but I've always been an organizer at heart. So I was always organizing around immigrant justice, economic justice, and I found myself working on the Sanders 2015-2016 campaign. Um, I always knew that climate work was really important, but I always saw it as like a rich person a white rich person issue. And like Caitlin said, the polar bears and the ice caps and like, yes, we have to save all of that. But like, I was focused on ensuring that my friends and family weren't getting deported. And when I worked on the Sanders campaign, they asked me to help develop the environmental justice platform for Puerto Rico. And doing that research, I it was such an eye-opening experience for me. That's when I realized that this is not just about the trees and the bears. It's such a it's a challenge that affects every single aspect of our lives from our energy sector, our economy. And I started to see how violent it was to specific communities in my community in particular. Um, so that is how I got my first job. I was pulled into it. And ever since then, I've been anchored in it because I see how it's really um, the challenge of our lives, of our lifetime. Thank you for sharing your story, Juliana. And Ella, how did you first come across um, a job in the climate space? Yeah, so my background um, in undergrad, I studied sociology. And so I really enjoyed seeing things um, similar to Caitlin from a more systemic lens. Um, but I just had no idea of what social issue I really wanted to dive deeper into and, and contribute to, um, which led me just to look at a nonprofit job board and see all the different um, orcs out there working um, with some type of mission in, in mind. And IMT, you know, it had a green lease posting um, for an internship. And I had no idea what green leases were. Uh, I knew that they had to do with buildings and that <clears throat> ultimately buildings affect people. So I applied. It felt like the characteristics of the job were well suited to me and the skills. Um, but it was really only after starting that that I realized how meaningful climate work really is to me and, and the real impact that it can have on people's lives. So, <laughs> yes. Great, thank you for sharing. So as you all um, you know, have heard some of these stories, our team does come from a variety of backgrounds with and without climate experience. Um, but I know that you know it is very hard work. Um, so what are some challenges you've experienced working in climate? Let's start with Caitlin. Uh, I think the biggest one is communicating with all of the different audiences and like IMT sits at the center of government and business and community and a lot of times those people all of those things like do not mesh and disagree and you want everyone to be on board with the solutions and but you wanna make sure that like community and justice is centered at that. And so I think one of the challenges has been um, just, just like coming up against people and saying, we need to make sure that community is centered and, and not being 
scared by the thought of like making the powers that be angry, you know, it's, it's okay to like lean into that discomfort and, and to do that, um, like breaking down those, those barriers between people. So that's, so it can be frustrating because you're like, just listen to the, to the community, you know? Great. Thank you for calling that out. Sarah Beth? Well, I have an extremely similar answer to that. <laughs> uh, as a fundraiser, I think a challenge that I have is connecting funders with climate change work in a way that frames it as sustainable for communities primarily, and then also for their focus areas. Uh, I sometimes find it difficult to frame climate change as a lens rather than a single issue. Uh, you know, like my colleagues are saying, climate change affects housing affordability, children's health, uh, economic independence. Almost anything you can think of can also be affected by climate change and currently is. Uh, so bringing that narrative to the funders can sometimes be challenging. But I will say it's also ultimately really rewarding when funder partners are very on board and you're like, wow, we're moving, you know. So the more that this challenge comes up, I like to think of it as an opportunity for uh, education and further partnership. Great. Thank you, Sarah Beth. Juliana, how about for you? Yeah, I mean, as rewarding as this work is, it is very challenging. And for me specifically, I have a background in organizing. Um, I'm also incredibly sensitive. So it's balancing um, being aware of all of these things that are occurring all the time, you know, like the murder of Tortuguita, an activist in Cop City, Atlanta, for protecting the area that they want to build a cop facility in. And hearing the, that news while I'm in a meeting, uh, having what I feel in that moment is a very boring and inconsequential conversation. So that is something that occurs almost on a weekly basis. And I just like genuinely want to scream all the time, but I have to like take a moment and like breathe and remind myself that I'm serving a purpose. And because this is an issue that's so all encompassing, I remind myself and I ground myself in the fact that everybody's playing their part. Everybody, if we all focus on the thing that we're, you know, trying to change and we all do this at the same time, then we will actually see change. Um, for, so for me, it's really balancing that like incrementalism and the fact that, yeah, change is slow, you know, and, and we have to do part of this work in this way, but knowing that there are other people out there that are organizing and like heartbreakingly losing their lives because of this um, crisis that we're in. Great, yeah, and thank you for sharing that and for putting that perspective in play as well. Um, Ella, how about for yourself? Yeah, mine is really similar to Juliana. Um, I would say when, people, when we join this work, oftentimes we do have this big passion and desire to see change happen and transformation happen um, for people, for buildings, for all these different sectors we're talking about. And so, yeah, with Juliana saying like the day-to-day -day work, it's not always, um, you know, resulting in incremental changes or transformation, but it's that little bit at a time. Um, so, you know, when I'm in the midst of, um, you know, analyzing a big application for green lease leaders um, that it may not feel like it's contributing a lot to this overall goal, but I know that it is and, and so everyone's job is, is necessary. Great. Rajiv? Well, I definitely share a personal experience with everything that each of my colleagues have stated. Um, to add to it or try to make, make it a little more different, I guess the two things I'll say is, um, so like my role now, I engage and talk to governments every day. Before joining IMT, I worked for the city of St. Louis and I was a governmental employee. And just that, um, you know, we the work that we do, whether you're a government employee or you work for a nonprofit or you're an activist, you're an advocate, whatever you are, because every job is a climate job, like Betsy said, is that knowing as you progress in this work, like you're working in a compromised system uh, with compromised players. But even with that acknowledgement, like the work can't stop. So you 
still have to navigate and work through that compromise while still trying to work towards that overarching goal of whatever your organization or the climate, you know, the climate goals of your community are. So, you know, learning that pragmatic pragmatic approach while still like having kind of like my um, childlike approach and fun with the work because it's really important. Um, and then also the other challenges too is, um, you know, I've worked for a lot of places where like I've been in the position of being like the only like non-Caucasian in the climate space. And that exists today with like the things I do outside of this work. Um, so there are a lot, there's oftentimes, you know, this movement has always been typically historically been um, Caucasian led and it's pushed people outside to the margins. So that's a challenge that still exists today. And it's nice working for an organization that you know, knows of that problem and works on figuring out how internally how to change that that narrative amongst ourselves. Great. Thank you all for sharing that. And, you know, again, this is um, very complex work. And one thing that I do want to make sure we cover is, um, you know, with all of that, what are your personal joys working in such a complex field? And how do you maintain um, and replenish that joy. So um, I will start here with Sarah Beth. You know, how do you maintain that joy? <laughs> For sure. So I would say that my personal joy in working in this complex field is I feel like I have more inner peace than I used to, which is a um, highly sought after resource in my personal life. I used to feel quite nervous frequently about my lack of time that I was putting into the climate movement when it felt like a largely insurmountable problem. Uh, I would say working in the climate field has really 180'd my personal thoughts and feelings on this. And I now feel like I'm contributing. I'm part of a larger movement. I'm, you know, applying my personal skills that I have to supporting others and their work. And being able to work at IMT has been such a a, a blessing to have that opportunity to like combine with others who are so talented to be able to move us towards these goals. Uh, in my personal life, I am part of a roller derby rec league, which is a, a good way to replenish joy and also blow off some steam. <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks for sharing, Sarah Beth. Juliana, how about for yourself? Yeah. Um... After being in this work for about 10 plus years, um, I have realized that one, I need to focus on the small victories. And a lot of the times you don't realize what those are, but there's so many along the way. You know, if you can get funding for a specific group that's doing incredible work, um, if you can get just one little bit of change in the city council or, you know, focus on that, amplify that, because those little changes and those little victories are happening all across this country and across the world. Um, and also like, go touch grass, <laughs> go walk outside, go breathe. Um, you know, I, I'm a very creative person. So I love to write. I take acting classes. I like to create fiction where I'm like imagining a utopia where I'm, you know, challenging myself to like visualize other systems and how things could be because, um, because we're capable of that, right? And I think art is really powerful. So that's how I maintain and replenish my joy. Thanks, Juliana. I have a very big urge to go to the park after, you know, I get off work today. So thank you for that reminder. Um, Ella, how about yourself? Yeah, my personal joy, you know, in the business field is to learn about communities and real estate owners that are able to adapt their buildings to be more energy efficient or more resilient. Um, so stories of owners that can give their um, residents more affordable housing because they reduce their energy bills through some upgrade, you know, that, that's amazing. Um, and it gives me a lot of joy. Um, I would say I maintain and replenish my joy from unplugging from social media and the internet to just read um, and to connect to the people around me and to really strengthen my own like individual relationships. Yeah, so no TikTok, no anything like that is it drains me. Um, and also staying connected to local politics that I can affect personally has been really helpful 
So I volunteer with a local nonprofit that does climate work. Um, and yeah, just being able to affect change and something that tangibly affects me has been really helpful too. Great. Caitlin, how about yourself? Um, so kind of similar to Juliana, I stay very rooted in imagination and world building. Like that's my theater background coming out, just the, the creation and destruction. That's my bread and butter. So I know that we are all working towards a more like beautiful and kind and equitable future. And I have this idea in my head of like what that's going to be like. And I so desperately want to see that actualized. Um, I think it's like doing a, like a physical task where it's so satisfying when you like put that Ikea couch together. Like, I just want to see it, <laughs> like you know, in real life. Um, and in terms of just like holding on to joy, uh, naps, uh, potatoes, high ropes, courses, cats, and video games. Those are, those do the trick. Amazing. Um, Rajiv, tell us about your joys. Um, my personal joys in working in such a complex field. Um, so like Juliana, I've been in this field for over 10 years. Um, it makes me feel old, but I'm not that old. I'm 33. Um, old to some, probably. Um, definitely people. So like, I'm originally from Chicago, but I've lived in St. Louis for nine years now. And like, this feat, this career that I've taken has allowed me like to travel the country. And when you do something like that, you just meet a lot of people and you meet a lot of stories. So like, I like learning the stories behind the, behind the, the, I like learning the stories behind that person, behind their work and like how it informs like what they do and why they do it. Um, so like storytelling, like it's very human. I love it. I do it a lot at home. I do a lot of writing myself like Juliana. Um, Cause like I come from a very strong STEM background. And so like the older I've gotten, I just do a lot. I do a lot more creative things that are not so STEM focused. And in terms of like maintaining and replenishing that joy, um, I work at a restaurant on the weekends. I love food. Food's like biggest part of my identity. And so I'm just like in the back of house, just like uh, cutting up sandwiches and make, making people's orders. Um, I love anything revolved around food, cooking it serving it for people. Yeah, like food is probably the biggest way I replenish that joy. Thanks, Rajiv. And now I am hungry for lunch at some point. So um, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so, you know, again, um, you know, hearing all the great things you all have been doing and your personal joys, um, you've convinced me at least, and hopefully everyone on this call that um, work this type of type of work can be fulfilling. So what tips do you have for people seeking a job in the climate space? Um, I will start with Juliana. Um, the advice that I have is probably contradic contradictory um, because I know sometimes you have to like get in where you fit in, especially when you're uh, you know new in your professional life and you know that you want to work in climate so you'll just take whatever job you can get so that you can start to build your career and like respect if that's the route that you decide to go by but as someone who has been working in this field for a long time I can tell you that the place that you work at is super important the culture there the way that they um, are addressing and tackling the climate crisis you really want to work for an organization that has like an ethos that matches your own um, where you can apply your, your actual skill set and the things that give you joy. Um, and also talk to people that like work there or have worked there because a huge part of your satisfaction, like I think it was, who was it that said this? Caitlin, that like, unfortunately, when you are doing something that you're really passionate about, employers can um, take advantage of that. And you don't want to get burnt out, put your um happiness first you know you're a human being first and then a worker so do a lot of research into the company that you're looking into or the organization that you're looking into talk to people that work there or have worked there um, and try to find a job that fits you know the things that make you um happy and the things that you're good at great thanks juliana um, ella any tips from you 
Yeah, I would say um, there's a lot of websites out there that have like green jobs or climate jobs, um, like idealist.com. Um, also, yeah, there's just like green job newsletters. Those are really helpful to see a variety of different spaces and areas um, that have jobs. Like there's agriculture, um, there is energy, there is, you know, uh, like plastics and corporate sustainability. So I would say definitely look through all the different job postings and see the skills and see where your like current role or your background, your studies really fit with a role. Um, and that would give you a really good chance at getting into that job. Great. Thanks, Ella. Caitlin? I would say the first step, and many of you have already got this by virtue of the fact that you're here, is just knowing that you have contributions to make and changes to implement and visions of a better world that are valuable. It doesn't matter if you are trained in the industry, you are alive and you are affected by the climate crisis. So you have the expertise and the instincts to create solutions. You don't need to reinvent yourself to fit the mold of what you think a professional, like a climate professional is. So just show up as yourself, stick to your values and know that you hold the key to something you know, specific that's gonna make our world a better place. I love that. Thank you, Caitlin. Sarah Beth? Quite similarly. <laughs> really, Caitlin, every time you say stuff, I'm like, yeah. And then I need to say the same thing. <laughs> but uh, my notes would say every job is a climate job. Like we are all saying that because it's true. Uh, as this being my first job in the climate field, I'm doing the same things I did at my old job task-wise, but was able to apply those skills to the climate field in a way that feels, you know, just way more meaningful. I would say make a list of your skills that you have or ones that you want to build, and then look at the lens of those skills to determine which jobs are applicable based on like what you want to be doing, you know, for 35, 40 hours a week, every day. Uh, and on the research side, I would recommend looking into, you know, everything that was listed, um, who external partners are of the company, who the partners work with, who the funders are, how they look into supporting community, and see if you feel like being a part of that ecosystem is really exciting to you. Because I think if the opportunity to be a part of the work at large feels exciting, doing the work will feel exciting. Hey, thanks, Sarah Beth and Rajiv. Want to close this out here? Sure. Um, so tips that I would share um, from my lived experience, like I remember I like if you had a LinkedIn, I was in your LinkedIn. If you had a social media profile, I was in your DMs. I uh, I'm not afraid to just like cold call people or cold DM people. So if, if you're comfortable doing that, like do that, like set up informational interviews. Like if, you know, I know we have like a range of people here today, but if you're like fresh out of college and you're not exactly sure where to start that informational interviews, those kind of things like was really helpful for me. Um, especially when I was talked to either prospective employers or people in the industry or like old professors, that was very valuable. And then for those of you who may be like, maybe you're already in the climate space right now, but you're like, you're not liking what you're doing. So you're trying to like figure out, like recalibrating what you're going to do next is um, like take some time off. If, if you have the means and the circumstances to be able to do that, like take the time off to like, you know, write down your priorities and figure out like how, like, what is it that you want out of that organization, like Juliana was saying, cause like culture is super important. For me, it's like the most important thing, like my mental health, my work-life balance and the culture, like that's what I look, those are the three things I look for in a job now, not necessarily focused on the, uh, the actual subject matter that the company is doing. So yeah, th those would be, those would be my tips. And, you know, I know Betsy's going to say, uh, mention this, but like, you know, there's spots here at um, IMT, like we've shared our contact information, like hit up, hit us up, contact us, like happy to talk to you. Great. 
Thanks, Rajiv. And thanks, everyone, for sharing all those wonderful tips. Um, so right now, um, I want to just switch gears and make sure we hold some time for Q&A. Um, I hope this conversation generates additional questions or thoughts from our participants um, as we jump into um, this section now. So please go ahead and type your questions in the Q&A box, and we'll do our best to address each of them. I'm going to actually pass it over to my colleague, Julia Eagles, right now. She's been monitoring the chats, and um, she'll be monitoring the Q&A. So uh, Julia, um, let us know what questions you've received and um, we'll pass those along to the panelists. I'll give folks a minute and maybe while, while they do that, I, I have a question of my own that I wanted to ask, um, which I think you all have really demonstrated for us well just through this conversation. But can you tell us um, how you show up and how you bring your whole selves to this work and why that matters? And maybe whoever wants to kind of jump in on that one. I mean, I can take a stab at it first. Um, that's, I think, probably the thing that I've recognized as the most important thing. One of the most important themes for myself is really showing up as myself and not masking, not suppressing the gut instincts that I have to speak up and to be contradictory, because I have to remind myself constantly that people from my background don't always have a seat at this table, and I have a responsibility to speak up for my lived experience, for my community. And another thing is that your true self, your authentic self is always gonna be right. I strongly believe that that's a universal truth for me. Whatever your truth is, whoever you truly are, that's right. And um, hopefully you all will, will land in a place where that is um, valued and celebrated, but to be very real with you all, there's probably going to be places where that's not going to be the case. And I want to encourage you all to, if you find yourself in that position, to find your inner courage and fight to make a change internally within the organization. I had um, an unofficial mentor. His name was Larry Cohen. He used to be the head of the Communication Workers of America. And he would always tell me, Juliana, the work is internal. Most of the time when you're working for a mission-driven organization, 60% of the work is actually going to be changing the organization and the way that they do things. So keep that in mind that you might have to fight some internal battles. I don't know if that's the best way to frame it, but um, yeah. Anyone else want to jump in on bringing I'll, your whole selves? I'll, I'll add to that. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'm... I'm the of the panelists. I'm the newest to IMT. I joined three months ago, um, and I've been. I, I my introduction to IMT, like I knew who IMT was, so I had a, a certain level of comfortability and trust. Um, and I knew people here before coming in this place. Obviously, I didn't know everyone, but um, like the things that struck me that I was like allowed me to like like they hired Rajiv so they're they're gonna get Rajiv is like it's been it's been a very welcoming place particularly from like the panels that you see here have been very welcoming to me and like getting to know me first versus like hey Rajiv like how are we gonna get Philadelphia to pass a BPS no, no that's not like the first thing so um straight away it just felt like for me like that just reinforced just me being myself um it's gotten me it's allowed me to have a lot of fun so far like there is a there's an absurd amount of people here at IMT that have some type of theater background which I did not expect and then I just learned today like Juliana is taking acting classes so um I think we're gonna have to have some fun with that um so yeah I mean the like I said the culture has been really important for me and like how I work so um it like the culture has been very welcoming for me to be my whole self and like now like you know we have funny g chats together and we have conversations with each other we're getting to learn each other so that that is all rooted in like how i'm going to continue to like have fun and succeed in a place like this great well we've got some great questions coming in here through the chat and the q a um i'm going to start with our question in the q a here with um Asking if there, if you have any advice for someone who's trying to switch into a climate focused job but keeps not hearing back from places. Anyone with those kind of, that kind of experience? I can try this one. 
Uh, first, I would say that's a bummer and I'm sorry. It's frustrating to put yourself out there and not get a response. Uh, in terms of like practicality, one of my recommendations is quite similar to Rajiv's to see if there's somebody there who you can cold call. Uh, fundraisers love a cold call. I love a cold call. <laughs> and I think it's worth, if you are comfortable doing so, you know, going on the staff directory or going on the web page and seeing who would be someone who might be interested in speaking with you, uh, who you haven't spoken with thus far in the hiring process and say like, I really want to work with you all because of X, Y, and Z uh, around the mission and the, the culture of the organization. You know, is there an opportunity for us to chat about it? Um, and then the answer could be like, yes, I'd love to. And the answer might be no, but uh, I think it's worth trying. You know, you never know what you're going to get until you try. And I think part of it is just a numbers game, uh, which is also a bummer. But I bet whoever put that question in there is doing really great work and is excited to be here and will find their place. So I am rooting for you. I would say another thing is I know you're anonymous, but if you want to send me your resume and cover letter, like I'm happy to take a look at it. Um, Cause I know a big thing for me was that I was applying to jobs. Like I was applying in my industry. And so I was using the terminology from like the arts industry. And it's just, for me, it was just like simple word switches or focusing on different um, mm, what's the word, like uh, achievements, deliverables, et cetera, and like framing them in different ways. Well, we've got another great question here in the chat from Caroline that I'll go to here, um, who says, I noticed a lot of climate jobs are remote. Are any of you part of other climate related organizations in your city outside of your job? Wondering how to keep the sense of physical community going if I end up working in a remote job, which I know for IMT we'll, we'll have some relevant experience on. So this is like my first, like in the pandemic, obviously like we were all fo forced to go to re remote, but this is like my first employer where it's where it's completely remote. So that's been a little bit of a, an adjustment that I'm going to a fully remote position, but um, how I keep that sense of physical community. So like here in St. Louis, St. Louis is a pretty small city. I think of it more as like a big town. Um, so the, the people who work in the climate space or the activism space, like you meet and know all those people pretty quickly. Um, I'm on a couple different boards here. I still volunteer with a couple activist groups. Um, I'm not a religious person, but St. Louis is very much uh, has like a strong Catholic um, uh, focus here. And there are a lot of churches, but there are a lot of churches and places of faith that do climate work. And so like I'll like volunteer like on the north side of St. Louis at this um, missionary Baptist church because I've known the local reverend for the past six years now. And he's actually one of the biggest um climate leaders here in the region. So just like general volunteering, um, because of like circumstance, St. Louis is such a small place, like you know, like what's going on pretty, pretty readily, like if you've got, you know, like, a, you know, a phone on you. So that's how I, that's how I um, keep to that sense of physical community, community here. I was just going to add on to, um, so I'm based in Fairbanks, Alaska, and Alaska has its own very unique like climate context, um, extremely cold, dependent on oil, um, dependent on coal because that's what's available and cheap. So it's been really meaningful for me to volunteer with a local climate action organization here called um, Fairbanks Climate Action Coalition. And I was really surprised that we even had like a dedicated organization for that. Um, but working with that group, um, like we've been working on a climate action plan for the city of Fairbanks. And so that's been really helpful because in my remote work, I'm helping other cities um, and helping businesses, but I don't have that tangible tie to them, like in my community context. And so exactly like Caroline said, I was looking for something that I could actually uh, relate to and was my own context. And that's been super helpful. 
I was also going to add, um, you know, as an employer, you could also check with the organization and see what efforts they have in place to help support that sort of community engagement or involvement. Um, you know, at IMT, we offer volunteer time for folks to be engaged with their community, be it climate related or outside of that, um, a couple of hours every week. Um, so that's also a way where, you know, as employers, we can also think about, um, you know, how are we supporting employees um, in that sense with, um, you know, all the remote work going on and how to build that sense of community alongside some of the work that, you know, everyone's doing as well. well we've got another great um, question, anonymous question here in the Q&A, uh, which is how have your careers in the climate field shaped you as people? I'll, I'll take the first stab at this. That's a it's a very broad question and it makes me go and you know we don't have enough time for that so whoever you are have to reach out to me I'm happy to talk to you more about that but for me um how does it shape me as a person um well taking a step back like i said i'm originally from chicago and um i think i'm immensely proud from being chicago like chicago is my heart and when i look back at it i think that like just being from chicago um I've realized has like kind of set me on this path of like this personal career path that I've gone on. Chicago's known for its architecture and its buildings. Um, Chicago has a huge breadth of environmental activism. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Hazel Johnson, she's from Chicago. She's considered the mother of environmental justice, and that started in Chicago at at at, how, at, um, at a housing project on the south side. Um, so like consciously and unconsciously, like all that stuff has been infused into me and has definitely shaped um, like what I'm, what I'm doing now. But like now, like how has it shaped me also, like the work that I do now is um, patience and empathy. Uh, like there are a lot of different stakeholders involved in this work. The climate space is so big. IMT is focused on buildings, but like the building space is, you know, huge. And so uh, having the patience to like do that change that we're trying to do in terms of policy or, or a power shift or a cultural shift. And then again, the empathy for just like making sure like, like we're challenging my, I'm challenging my own assumptions. Like just cause I've done this work doesn't mean like that's the way the work continues, needs to continue to do. So like it's, working in the climate space can constantly ask myself to like challenge my own assumptions. Yeah, um, to add to that, I wanna <laughs> echo everything Rajiv said, patience and like perspective has been a big one. Um, and also like learning your history, right? Because I was um, naively under the impression that this was a rich white people <laughs> movement, but that's not the truth. When you, read about the climate movement, you know, you see that we really sit on the so on the shoulders of giants and indigenous people have been the original stewards and fighters of this land and they're still here and they're still doing it. Um, so it has given me a lot of, um, I guess a lot of like uh, uh, humbleness where I, I feel like it's so important to um, learn your history and take a step back and recognize that so much has happened and so much has changed and also understanding that like this is probably a fight that's going to last for generations upon generations um and really kind of taking that in and seeing what seeing what I'm doing as like I know this is going to sound like hippy dippy but like as like a labor of love to the earth and knowing that you know, I, we're, we're all going to die, right? Like none of us are going to live forever. Um, and <laughs> what we can do here is do our best um, and, and, and give our service as, as a labor of love. So I really, like, I ground myself in like in that ministry and it's almost become like a spiritual thing for me where I'm getting very philosophical here, but who knows what's in the afterlife. But I do know that what I, what I do here is going to hopefully have an impact on future generations and on the the health and and the the health of the earth. 
So building on that last question too, I'm gonna um, raise one here from Michelle in the chat. What has surprised you the most about working in the climate space? I'll, I'll share a personal anecdote. Um, like earlier I said, you know, you meet a lot of people and you hear a lot of stories. Um, I think everyone is familiar with the, uh, the food product spam. I have a point with where I'm going with this, by the way, um, spam, you know, like the weird ham type thing. Um, so before I joined, before I joined IMT, like I said, I worked for the city of St. Louis. I oversaw our benchmarking law, um, trying to get large buildings to track their energy use. And for a lot of that, like I used to do these like one-on-ones with property managers to walk them through on how to benchmark their building. And there's a company here in St. Louis called Precoat Metals. Um, never heard of them before, didn't know what they did. And what I learned is that every, they make the cans for spam, every can of spam that is dis distributed in this country and across the world all comes from St. Louis. So that was just like a real weird surprise that I learned from the job. So that's probably not what you were looking for, for your, for your question, but like, that's just a story that I always think about. Cause it's, it's just oddly funny to me. I, All right. Oh, go ahead, Juliana. Oh, I mean, I, I have a lot of surprises <laughs> that I see all the time. And the biggest one is like, not to be a bummer, but like how intentional a lot of this stuff is. Like it doesn't just happen with an invisible hand. An invisible hand doesn't decide where coal power plants go or where the dumping goes. It goes intentionally into places where these companies know that people don't have the power to fight them dumping in those areas. And I am, it, I'm never, it never ceases to surprise me how intentional and violent a lot of these acts are from these nefarious actors. Um, and they bet on people to not pay attention. They bet on people to say, well, I'm powerless. But I've also seen how communities have effectively fought back and have cleaned up those sites and have forced those companies to shut down or go somewhere else. Um, so, you know, pay attention and never underestimate the power that you and your community hold. All right, to take a bit of a turn um, here toward another, some, some more practical advice to end on, I think we'll do our last question came in from Tamar here in the Q&A, which is if most of my climate experience is in my volunteer work and my hard skills are all in a different sector, how do I balance those two in a cover letter slash resume? I would say, so your resume has your hard skills and those skills are the same regardless of like where you're working at. And so similar to like what Caitlin talked about of wordsmithing out maybe key frame phrases if you're trying to switch sector sectors, um, but also like having the basic resume facts, like really trying to put in numbers, like number of the data sets analyzed, number of people impacted with your work. Those are all great figures to put. Um, I would say your resume or your cover letter is really the area where you can frame your story of like why you're trying to get into the climate field, all the reasons you did your volunteer work in the climate space that now have given you that like expertise and understanding and how you can bring your background and your previous job, your successes there into this new job and like really gear it towards the specific characteristics of that position. So if it is like a clean energy job and you are working in manufacturing, like really going in on why you're getting into clean energy and um, how all those skills like directly translate into this role and might be a really good fit. I think it also might be um, just a, a realistic thing of if you're switching industries, it's not always going to be like a lateral move and that you might have to like go back to like a more entry level job before working your way up. So it might be easier, like if you're in, a, in the finance sector and you really want to work in the climate, maybe do like kind of a gap job at a green bank. So you can say that like, okay, I'm, I'm now more familiar with the climate space. And then you can like use that to kind of leapfrog to like the next thing. Um, and also like your volunteer work is work like that's, you know, you, you, those are skills like don't don't discount that because um, a lot of times that's where uh, you're making more of an impact.
Well, great. So I know we are close to um, 1 p.m. here, and I wanted to make sure we just um, close the webinar out. Um, so I want to thank our IMT team for sharing their insights. And, you know, I want to thank everyone for joining today's chat and asking some really great questions. Um, we hope you leave today's webinar um, with some helpful perspectives and tips. And also, um, you know, we'll be sending out a follow-up email with additional information. And so check out our IMT jobs page for any current openings. Um, and we hope to see you at our next Climate Career Chat. Um, we will have everyone's contact info in the follow-up email as well um, that we're on. On the panelists and again they're you know super open to having a conversation so please do reach out but thank you again um everyone for joining and hope to see you at our next one more details to come Bye. thanks all thank you